Welcome back, Highlanders, to Chapter 2 of Econ 143. And this chapter is just going to be some basic terms and definitions that you're going to need to know moving forward uh, through the rest of the class. And of all the chapters, this is one of the uh, shortest chapters, so uh, it shouldn't take you too long to watch these videos. And there's only going to be two parts to this chapter, again, because it is relatively short. So here's the overview for this chapter. We're going to talk about renewable versus non-renewable resources. What's the difference between those, along with a few examples of each. And then we're going to talk about intertemporal trade-offs and the idea of sustainability. What does that mean within both the economic and environmental lens? And then we're going to talk a little bit about the production possibilities curve. Hopefully something you remember from your uh, Econ 3 classes and how that relates to the idea of sustainability. And that'll be it for part one. And then in part two, we're going to pick it up with the idea of assimilative capacity, uh, the difference between cumulative versus non-cumulative pollutants, and the difference between point source and non-point source pollutants, and then continuous versus episodic emissions. And so those are going to be some basic definitions that you're going to need to know moving forward through the rest of the course. So let's get into it with uh, renewable versus non-renewable resources. So a renewable resource is a resource that grows in time according to its biological process. So it's a resource that can replenish itself and uh, usually quickly enough to uh, be considered renewable within the human lifespan or the human time scale. Uh, so many of these resources are living. These would include things like fisheries and timber stands. So you can cut down trees and have trees grow again within your lifetime. You can harvest fish and again have those fish repopulate within your lifetime. But these could also be non-living uh, sources, such as the sun's energy. That's a uh, renewable resource, right, as long as that sun keeps on shining. Uh, so again, fisheries, timber sands, solar energy, these are all examples of renewable resources. Now, when it comes to non-renewable resources, these are resources uh, for which there is no process of replenishment. Uh, so uh, examples of these might include petroleum reserves and non-energy mineral deposits. Uh, there are certain resources that have replenishment rates, but they are uh, incredibly slow, so slow that they're effectively non-renewable, at least within the uh, human uh, time scale. So with that in mind, again, uh, some of these resources might indeed replenish, but it might take millions of years for them to replenish. If that's the case, then we, can, we still consider them a non-renewable resource. So kind of make sure you know the difference between those two types of resources. Moving forward, so uh, example of a non-renewable resource might be those petroleum deposits or oil that we use in our world. Uh, so with that in mind, like what do we do uh, with these non-renewable resources? When will they end? For example, when will the world run out of oil? So up here I have some very real data uh, from the federal government. It says that the world oil reserves are 60 billion barrels and the world oil use is 6 billion barrels per year. So the world oil reserves 60 billion barrels and the world uses 6 billion barrels per year. So think, when will the world run out of oil? Well, you don't need a calculator to do that math. If you're just doing the math, the year to depletion would be about 10 years. So in 10 years, we might run out of oil. Now, I told you this is real data but from the federal government, but I didn't tell you what year this data was from. This is real data from the year 1920. So according to this data, then we should have run out of oil by the year 1930, but of course we didn't. So let's look at some more updated numbers. Uh, more updated numbers reveal that the world's oil reserves are 531 billion barrels of oil, and the world uses 16.5 billion barrels per year. If you do the math on that, then the world should run out of oil in 32 years. Now, again, these numbers are more updated than those uh, ones from the uh, uh, column above it. But again, this is uh, data from the year 1970. So according to this, by the year 2002, we should have run out of oil. And of course, we have it. So more updated numbers says that there are a trillion uh, barrels of oil in the world oil reserves, and the world uses 26 billion barrels per year. All right, again, if you're doing the math, the year to depletion would be about 38 years before the world would run out of oil, and this is data from the year 2000. So maybe in the year 2038, we will finally run out of oil, but according to my most recent Google search, there are about 1.73 trillion barrels of oil in the world oil reserves. So what keeps happening here? Well, as the world continues to use more and more oil or find it uh, profitable to use more and more oil, then that gives oil suppliers an incentive to go out there and research and discover new ways of getting oil out of the earth. And so when we say world oil reserves, what we're really uh, referring to are known world oil reserves. And of course, as the incentive to discover more oil increases, 
then we're going to go out there and figure out different ways to refine and discover that oil and increase those known world oil reserves. Right? The um, more the world tends to use oil or depend on it, the higher the price of oil, the higher the price, the more incentive it gives those energy companies to find new ways of getting oil out of the earth. Right? Ways that might have been too expensive before when oil was cheap, but isn't quite as uh, expensive to do now that the price of oil is higher. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and watch a quick video clip about when the world will run out of oil. This is from a show called Miss Lies and Downright Stupidity with John Stossel. He's a former ABC News correspondent who used to do shows that were kind of like Mythbusters before Mythbusters existed. So here is one of the clips from the show about the world running out of oil. Let's take a look. Myth number 10. We start there. The world is running out of oil. Now, how can that be a myth? Everyone knows that's true, isn't it? Go organic for Earth Day. At Earth Day events last month, people were quick to tell us, we're running out of oil. It's running out quickly. We're going to run out really soon. It's an unrenewable resource. It's running out a lot sooner than you think. But what people don't know is that there's a vast supply of oil just 500 miles north in Canada. The tar sands of Alberta alone contain enough hydrocarbon to fuel the entire planet for over 100 years. What's he talking about? This is what the Canadian tar sands looks like. It's a Florida-sized patch of this disgusting stuff. Sand and rock mixed with oil. Lots of it. We're talking trillions of barrels. The whole planet from Alberta for about a century. Peter Huber, co-author of The Bottomless Well, says people think we're running out of oil because we're running out of cheap oil, the kind that's found in the Middle East, already liquid, clean, and ready to refine. It's very cheap to get that oil out of the ground, so of course that's where people go first. They can pull it out of the ground for five bucks a barrel. Less. That was once true in America, as Jimmy Stewart celebrated in the movie Thunder Bay. It costs three times as much to get oil out of these tar sands because they have to add hot water to the sand to separate the oil. But now that oil's expensive and likely to stay that way, companies find it profitable to do this. Clive Mather, who runs Shell in Canada, says the Earth's supply of hydrocarbons is almost infinite. And those are not running out. In fact, we've ha hardly started to develop them. When the price of oil is high, as it is now, it's profitable for companies to extract it from the tar sands. We may have to get used to paying more for gas, as Europeans do, because oil now comes from less accessible places. But the oil is out there. The planet contains huge amounts of buried hydrocarbons. The question is, can you get them out? At what price? But so why are we hearing all this stuff about running out? It's nothing new. People have been saying this for 150 years. They sure have. So-called experts say things like, we're going to become a dying civilization. We will see the extinction of Homo sapiens. People are always saying that about it can be Ebola, it can be flu, global warming. Sometimes uh, they're right, usually they're wrong, and they've been saying it about oil for a long time. The oil and natural gas... 29 years ago, President Carter said oil and gas... ...are simply running out. He said it would be gone in the next decade. People were saying that in, in 1880. They were saying it in 1910. Why do they keep getting it wrong? We get better at getting things out of the earth. We keep improving. And that's why the predictions keep being wrong. New seismic imaging now lets people see through miles of water and rock. And by bouncing sound waves and watching the results in 3D, lets them find pockets of oil that no one knew were there. I don't think we will ever run out of oil. Ships with their own drills travel farther from shore. And robots let them explore deeper beneath the ocean, where cameras watch sharks bite the pipes. Who knows what they'll discover tomorrow? But we know today that here in Canada alone, the supplies may last 100 years. All right. So, again, that clip kind of demonstrates this idea that even though a resource is non-renewable, it doesn't mean that we're going to be running out anytime soon. So let's go ahead and try to demonstrate this idea with a uh, quick story here. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and exit the uh, PowerPoint mode just because it's going to be easier for me to... Uh, draw this picture with uh, different colors uh, from this position here. So, again, I don't have great artistic abilities, but let's go ahead and do the best we can. So, again, we're going to have a tree here. Let's say that we are an economy that subsists completely on apples. 
right? We consume apples, we use apples for our energy source, right? We are an economy that survives completely on those apples. And let's just go ahead and say that with this tree here, there are some apples that have fallen off the tree and are laying on the ground, right? There's some apples that you can find on the bottom branches of the tree. There's apples that you can find on these middle branches. And there's apples that you can find here on the top branches. So with that in mind, when we're talking about the story here of how we keep getting it wrong when we're saying that we're constantly running out of oil, and as the price of oil goes up and we use it more, right, we find more efficient ways of getting oil out of our earth, right? We're going to kind of demonstrate that story with this uh, apple tree. So again, we have a village or an economy that subsists entirely on apples, right? Well, which apples do you think that they are going to go after first? Well, again, most people like to go after that low-hanging fruit in the beginning, or at least the ones that have uh, fallen off the uh, tree, right? So these are the apples that you're going to go after first. And because these apples are so cheap and easy to get, you can probably charge maybe five cents an apple and still make a profit, right? So people are going after these apples first. Now, when these apples start running out, people start crying, whoa, what are we ever going to do as this world is running out of apples? What are we going to eat? Where are we going to get our energy? And all it takes is for one entrepreneurial individual to look up into that tree and says, well, I see some apples there in the bottom branches. Let's go after those, right? Now, because they have to get maybe a ladder or some tools to climb those trees, because it takes a little bit more time and effort to harvest those apples, then they might sell those apples for 10 cents. And as people are willing to pay 10 cents for apples, more and more people are going to be willing to go up into those trees and get those apples from those lower branches. But once again, these apples are going to start to run out. And once again, the world's going to cry foul. Say, hey, we're running out of apples. What is ever going to happen to our economy? How are we ever going to get our food or energy now that these apples are running out? And once again, somebody says, well, we can go a little bit higher in the tree and get those harder to get apples, right? But in doing so, we have to charge more for them, maybe 15 cents an apple. And as people are willing to pay 15 cents an apple, again, people are willing to go higher in that tree in order to get them. But once again, those apples are going to start running out. And then once again, people are like, ah, we're running out of apples. How are we ever going to maintain our, uh, our current standard of living? And then again, you can go up higher in the tree, expend even more effort to get apples. But then those apples might cost, say, 20 cents, right? So again, we might have to get used to paying more for apples, but the apples are out there, right? And when those apples start running out, well, then what are we going to do now? Well, again, there might be a tree that is, say, further away from that village. That also has apples on it, but again, that we might have to be willing to pay more for, right? Now, once apples get so incredibly expensive that people aren't willing to pay for the, uh, those last few apples that are on that tree really far away, then we might switch to a different energy source, something like oranges or grapes or some other alter alternative energy source that's now become cheaper now that there's so few apples left that the apples have become incredibly expensive. Right, so I don't think this uh, society would ever completely run out of apples because they'll switch to an alternative energy source before then. Just like I don't think the world will ever really run out of oil because by the time those last few drops of oil are to be found and pulled out of the earth, oil will be so expensive that we all switched over to something else. So oil is a non-renewable resource. That doesn't mean that we're going to run out of it anytime soon or maybe even at all as, again, we might switch to alternative energy sources when oil becomes incredibly expensive. Right, so again... Just because a uh, resource is non-renewable doesn't necessarily mean that we'll be running out anytime soon. All right, so moving forward, let's talk a little bit about this idea of intertemporal trade-offs, and that is a trade-off between the present and the future. So an intertemporal trade-off is the idea that the things you do now could be affecting your future, right? The more oil we pump out of an underground deposit today, right, then the less oil there might be to extract in future years. Conversely, the more research we put into developing new ways of extracting oil and finding more oil reserves, well, then the more known oil we'll have to extract in future years. So again, we can make decisions today that can reduce the amount of uh, known oil left for us in the future, or we can make decisions today that might increase the amount of uh, known oil for us in the future. And this idea of intertemporal trade-offs apply to renewable resources as well. So in the case of, say, uh, fisheries, Right, the uh, harvesting rate of codfish today will affect how many codfish could be harvested in the future, as well as their size. Uh, in the case of, say, a timber stand, should you cut your trees today or let them grow into the future? If you decide to cut them today, then that might affect how many trees you have in the future. Or in some cases, you might want to cut just some of your trees 
uh, not necessarily all of them, as that might allow even for, uh, for even better growth in the future. Or in some cases, cutting all your trees might actually allow for better growth in the future. We'll talk about those kinds of trade-offs when we get into Chapter 7 on renewable resources. All right, so intertemporal trade-offs apply to both non-renewable and renewable resources. And that brings us to this idea of sustainability. So sustainability is the idea of making decisions in the short run that do not have serious negative impacts in the long run. Right, so sometimes the way that we uh, farm or produce food could have negatively affect our environment depending on the kinds of uh, pesticides or chemical fertilizers that we use and whether or not there's runoff there that affects other parts of the environment. Right, so in some cases we could be making decisions now that could reduce our ability to produce in the future. The idea of sustainability is the decisions we make now do not seriously uh, reduce our ability to produce in the future. So an example of that that we're going to be talking about in Chapter 8 is permaculture is kind of a sustainable form of agriculture where we do things that are going to be more likely to lead to future growth rather than the uh, degeneration of our land or our environment. So you see a picture here of uh, this is a guy by the name of uh, Tyler who I met over in uh, Thailand when I was working on a permaculture farm over there in 2018. And Tyler showed me these worm castings where basically he fills these basins with pig manure and then he puts worms in there and as the worms work their way through the pig manure they kind of recycle the nutrients and then he just pours water in these basins and they uh, drain out of a spigot there at the bottom and that's some uh, nutrient rich water that he can use to fertilize crops with it's not uh, chemically oriented so it's not going to destroy the land or have any kind of runoff uh, that's going to uh, hurt the environment Right, but it's something that can last into the future and again make sure that that land stays uh, viable for production in the future. So let's talk a little bit about how this idea of sustainability relates to our production possibilities curve, which again hopefully you remember from your Econ 3 class. So the production possibilities curve shows the different maximum combinations of two things society can produce at any given time, given three assumptions. One is it's uh, given its current level of resources given its uh, current level of technology, and then three is that it's using those resources fully and efficiently, right? So again, this is the maximum combinations of things that we can produce as a society, given our current resources, our, our current technological uh, capacity, and the idea that we're using these resources fully and efficiently. So let's go ahead and draw ourselves some production possibilities curves. Again, at least I uh, hope you remember them, but if not, uh, we'll go through them to make sure that you get an idea of what they look like. So again, I'm going to exit our full screen mode so that I can use our colors here. Um, so when drawing this production possibilities curve, we're going to have a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. Let's say in this environmental economics class that the vertical axis represents market goods. Let's say for the sake of argument that our horizontal axis represents our environmental quality. So this production possibilities curve represents the maximum amount of market goods that we can produce and environmental quality we can have at any uh, given point in time, given our current level of resources and our technology. Now, most uh, production possibilities curves are what we call bowed outward. That represents this idea of increasing opportunity costs, right? And again, in terms of what these uh, curves represent is how much we can produce of both of these things. So we're going to go ahead and draw a couple points. So let's say that this is one of the points that could be on this production possibilities curve. So notice that if we're at this point, we're producing a lot of market goods, right? So call that M1 for our market goods. And we have a certain level of environmental quality, which we will call E1, right? And then we're going to draw, that, uh, draw a comparative point. This point here. This represents the amount of environmental quality we have at this point. And this is the amount of market goods that we are producing at that point. So economy uh, one here is, uh, so we're going to label these two and one. So economy one here is producing more market goods. As a result of that production, though, they might have lower environmental quality, whereas economy two is uh, producing fewer market goods, 
but uh, again, as part of that trade-off, has more environmental quality. And the idea about the production possibilities curve is that if you're operating on that curve, you're operating at what's called an efficient point, and that means that you can't uh, uh, do more of one thing without having less of another, right? So if you're at point one there, you can't uh, have more environmental quality unless you're going to have fewer market goods. If you're at point two, you can't have more market goods unless you're going to have uh, less environmental quality. So what do we mean when we talk about sustainability in uh, economics? Well, let's go ahead and draw another uh, production possibilities curve here. So that is the curve right now, given our current level of uh, resources and technology in that first graph we draw, right? But again, if we're drawing this uh, curve again, what's going to happen in the future? So again, these are our market goods. And down here is going to be our environmental quality. And again, we might have a production possibilities curve that looks something like that, right? Again, it's going to be kind of bowed outward with that quarter circle, right? So again, if this is the present, and this graph might represent the future, oops, didn't mean to do that. Make that. So yeah, so the first graph represents the present, and the second graph represents the future, Right, well then what's going to happen with these two economies? Well, it may be the case that with our first or sorry, our second economy, the one that is focusing on more environmental quality and maybe producing fewer uh, market goods now, you might see the production possibilities curve shift out as we maybe advance our technology or our amount of resources, right? As long as the production possibilities curve either stays where it is or shifts out, right? Then that's what we would call sustainable. Right, so again, if it stays where it is or if it shifts out, then that is what we'd label as sustainable. Now, if a production possibilities curve shifts inward, maybe because we've uh, degraded the environment so much that we cannot produce more in the future, right? We can actually only produce less in the future. So in other words, if economy one sees a production possibilities curve shift inward like that, right? Well, then this is an example of it no longer being sustainable, Right. So in other words, sustainability is that production possibilities curve either staying where it is or shifting outward. Right. Something being not sustainable means that production possibilities curve is shifting inward or you can't do in the future what you could have done before. So, again, if our current uh, actions are reducing our future opportunities, then that is what we call not sustainable. But if our current actions are not, reduce, re, not reducing our future opportunities, but are keeping our future opportunities either the same or improving them, then that is what we would call sustainable. Right? So hopefully you get the idea of sustainability and how that relates to that production possibilities curve. Moving forward, right? Uh, another thing I want you to know about the production possibilities curve is that the exact shape and location of that production possibilities curve are determined by an economy's technological capacity, right? So the better the technology, the more that curve will shift out. Or again, maybe the more resources that we discover or find, then the more that curve will shift out. So that's what determines where that curve is, right? But whether we are economy one or economy two on that curve, so where we choose to locate on that production possibilities curve, right, that is a more of a matter of uh, social choice. Right, so the, whether we choose to produce, say, more market goods and have uh, less environmental quality, or whether we choose to produce fewer market goods and have more environmental quality, right, that is a matter of where society chooses to locate uh, based on their preferences. So the production possibilities curve itself is kind of a technical constraint of what's possible, but where we choose to locate on that curve is a matter of social preference, right? So if you are maybe a more liberal or a Democrat, right, they tend to uh, talk about environmental quality over production. So they might be somebody who's more likely to uh, be at, say, 0.2 uh, in that previous graph. If you are, say, a Republican or conservative, they often talk about uh, production over the environment, traditionally speaking anyway. And so they might be uh, more likely to operate as economy one on that production possibilities curve. But again, to the economists, neither one is necessarily uh, morally superior. It's more a matter of uh, competing preferences. Do we want to have more production and maybe uh, higher living standards today at the expense of future environmental quality? Or do we want to have less production and maybe lower living standards today at the expense of uh, having uh, more environmental quality and maybe a, a better uh, uh, future? 
So with that in mind, that is uh, the end of part one for chapter two. We're going to pick it up uh, here next class, and we're going to start talking about the idea of assimilative capacity. We're going to get into a little bit of economic philosophy about finding um, optimal levels of uh, certain things, and then we are going to um, uh, close it out by talking about a few more definitions that you're going to need to know for the rest of the quarter. But that's it for now. Let me know if you have any questions. You can shoot me an email or visit me during those Zoom office hours. I'll be uh, looking forward to hearing from you. And uh, if you want, you can also let me know kind of how the class is going so far. Uh, I look forward to hearing any feedback that you might have. But until then, stay safe and healthy, and I look forward to talking to you all next time.